Hey everyone, and welcome back to Exposing SMG. I'm back with another recap and lie compilation of Harry and Meghan's Netflix soap opera. I already covered episode 1 and episode 2 in two explosive videos exposing them and their lies, so go check them out. I didn't think they can stoop any lower in this episode, but they do. Going as far as using Britain's history with slavery and claiming they are victims of that in some sense, and then of course comparing the Queen's legacy with the Commonwealth to the British Empire. Oh yeah, there's a lot to dissect here. Before we start, be sure to like and subscribe for more videos, let me know if you enjoy these recaps and lie compilations, share this video if you enjoyed it, and follow us on our social media. Without further ado, here is the recap of episode 3. I will talk about their lies toward the end, and there are video chapters available for you to skim through. The episode starts off with their engagement interview, which Megan annoyingly calls an orchestrated reality show. Right off the bat, 15 seconds in and I'm already annoyed. How can an interview be compared to a reality TV show? How in brainy, quirky Meg's head does that make sense? She lies some more about that and calls it rehearsed, and then the BBC fires back at her, but I'll get into that later in the video. They quickly stop playing the engagement interview right before they explain how the proposal went down, because as I exposed in my episode 2 recap, they lied about the proposal too. Or at least gave two versions of a story, because that's what liars do. Megan's doing the usual complaining this time, specifically complaining about being told to show the ring. And this woman literally has a problem with everything. A normal, exciting, show us the ring, is now something she's complaining about? What a loser. They of course bring up Diana, not even two minutes in, and Harry from the engagement interview says that Diana would love her and both she and Megan would be as thick as thieves. Sure, not even Diana's own family could see the comparisons there, but sure. They then spend a big portion of the episode talking about the British Empire, and they have David Olsaga, who is featured throughout the episodes, talking about how Britain has its first black princess with Meghan. I wonder how much Meghan paid him to call her that. David, alongside journalist Afua Hirsch, spend about 10 minutes talking about how Britain played a role in world history, and David asks, who's paid the cost in all of this? Which I'm assuming he wants to say victim Harry and Meghan because why else is there a history lesson about this in the episode? Afua jumps in and is like, Britain actually enslaved more Africans than the United States of America. They talk some more about how slavery was fueling the early British Empire, and I have to ask, what does this have to do with Harry and Meghan? How in your own ass do you have to be to have the audacity to compare slavery and what happened all those years ago, and somehow correlated to yourselves today, to your story, which this docuseries is branded as. The worst part is they're trying to turn it into a Britain versus America thing, when America has its own demons as well. While Britain got rid of all the enslavement of Africans, Americans were still dealing with laws of segregation, Jim Crow laws, and so much more. So again, what's the point of this segment? Afawa then says that the first ever commercial slave voyage conducted by Britain was personally financed by Queen Elizabeth I, who died in 1603 by the way, and that it continued to be financed by the kings and queens of the royal family until it was abolished in the 1800s. After that history lesson, David says that Harry and Meghan's engagement was significant because of Britain's history. I think that because Meghan and Harry can't benefit from the royal family, they, more so Meghan because Harry doesn't have the brain capacity to think for himself, want to forever brand the monarchy as racist alongside the people. Because Meghan didn't get her way. Why else is there a 10 minute history lesson on Britain in the first 10 minutes of the episode? She also wants to brand the Brits as racist for her own vile agenda, but if we take one look into America's present day climate, not even history, but present day climate, we have a huge issue with racism. So the fact that they included this segment in the episode just shows that this is an attack on the royal family because this shady history didn't stop Meghan from wanting to still work with them after stepping down in January 2020. Meghan still went ahead and married into the so-called racist family with a husband who dressed up as a Nazi for Halloween. The history didn't matter until they told you, no, you can't use us and our titles to get by in Hollywood. Later on in the episode, they revisit the Commonwealth topic, this time insulting the Queen. They show the Queen talking on Commonwealth Day, when she was young and then later on in her reign, 
and they bring in Afu again, who says that Britain played a strategic role in colonialism to independence and how their British Commonwealth is really just the British Empire 2.0 and that the Commonwealth is a privileged club of formerly colonized countries, and that the monarchy is using the Commonwealth as the reason to keep the monarchy. They mentioned that it was the Queen's life mission to fight for the institution and keep it together, and basically insinuate that the Commonwealth is a fraud term that is used, and that the Commonwealth is just the monarchy's version of better PR, but nothing has changed. They took wealth from black countries and left them poor so they can be forever wealthy, and those black countries in return will be forever poor. But again, if this is the case, and I'm assuming it is because they purposely put this in the documentary to abolish the monarchy, why marry into a family with such a toxic background? Smart brainy Megs surely knew what the history book said, no? But to now want to talk about history when you had no problem with it before shows how much she doesn't care about anything unless it can aid in her agenda. They then said that Megan looked like most of the people in the Commonwealth and she represented something. Oh really? The majority of the Commonwealth people are white passing thirsty American actresses? That's news to me. They then use the tragic story of Stephen Lawrence who was a black kid murdered by white thugs and they show how Harry and Meghan attended a memorial for him. And then Afwa is like, Harry went from being someone I would assume to be a little bit racist to being anti-racist. What? Going back to the beginning following the engagement interview, Megan then pretends that she's never seen videos or pictures of a walkabout because she's still trying to combat the Megan was obsessed with the royal family theory. They then show us Harry and Megan doing their first official walkabout together following the engagement, and brainy smart not pretty Meg asks Harry, what's a walkabout? As if it's not self-explanatory. You walk about. What's there not to get? Throughout the episode, they keep showing us positive press about Meghan and how the British people loved her at first. They show us all the members of the royal family saying they are thrilled about the news of the engagement. And then they show us people at the walkabout loving Meghan, calling her lovely. Harry says she's a breath of fresh air for the monarchy. How happy everyone was. Which again, if they hated you because you were black, it's not like you changed. You were mixed race in the beginning, you're mixed race then. Obviously, they hated you for other reasons. We jump to New York and Meghan is getting ready and she's like, H, can you DJ? And something about her calling Harry H is just nauseating because it comes up forced. They then show us Mandana Diani and under her name it says friend. Because what else are they going to say? Former CEO of Archwell who resigned days before Netflix premiere and only worked with them for 18 months? I should make a video on their staff that keeps dropping like flies. Anyway, so they show us this portion which is definitely scripted where Mandana's like, anyone can call themselves a royal expert? And Megan's like, mostly royal experts. And then Professor Harry then goes on about this whole tangent about how anyone can be a royal expert and how it's an extended PR firm for the family. And that the press wants to name people royal experts just for credibility to make the media legit. So are they hobos on the street that incorrectly use the term royal expert? Or are they the PR firm for the family who would assumingly be in touch with the royals or their people and therefore are indeed actually royal experts? You're not very pretty, and you're not very bright. I'm so glad we had that talk. Harry and Meghan aim to discredit the media as we learned from my episode 2 recap. And yes, all these royal experts who have investigated, researched, written articles, written books, spoken with royals, and spoken with people who knew the royals, are just fake experts, with their only purpose being to give the media credibility and everyone in the media are out to get Meghan and Harry. Got it. Harry's like, it comes down to control. It's like this family is ours to exploit. Their trauma is our story and our narrative to control. All Harry and Meghan have done is exploit Diana and the trauma that has caused. Not once caring that, oh, hmm, maybe William doesn't want his mother constantly used for Meghan's agenda. They then show us the same video of Diana that they have abused in every episode I've seen so far. And then they show us a young Prince Charles saying that you have to work out some kind of method to deal with the press so you don't go mad. Advice that Harry should have probably listened to. This is the way to go about it. Have a healthy relationship with the press instead of trying to censor them. The press isn't controlling anything. The press is writing about what's happening and they're uncovering what's not being brought to light. Harry sitting there cosplaying as an intellectual and explaining what the press is isn't the tea spill he thinks he's giving. You're not very pretty and you're not very bright. Now notice how they continue to bring on their employees, Tim Burt being one of them, where he talks about an unwritten contract between the institution and the press to cover members of the royal family. Like, no duh. 
No way did you think you were going to be royals and you're not gonna get any media coverage. Afawa's like, it's not fair that you can be born into a contractual relationship with the British media. And girl, what are you talking about? Archie and Lilibet have been born into this Netflix deal and their pictures and private photos and all that have been aired on for millions of people. Were they part of the Netflix contract? At the end of the day, you're a public figure. You enjoy the lavish life that British people pay for through taxes. You do things for the public and therefore you need and want in most cases to have your lives covered by the press. Of course, there are press relationships because that's how it is for everyone. Celebrities, political figures, day-to-day -day news. You don't get the fruits of royalty without having to deal with the press. What are these whining babies doing? And this is professional gaslighting on a different level, especially since Megan was paying PR firms to make sure people talk about her in the media. One of my good friends, Shallon Lester, exposed that well over a year ago. I told you guys before, I used to be the editor of a celebrity magazine, I was the editor of Star, and people would always ask me when I worked there, like, okay, like, what stories are real? And I'd be like, okay, every story is real, except for the ones about the royal family. And this was prior to Meghan Markle coming on. I'm like, the the palace is just a tight ship. Like there's, people don't blab, you know? So our stuff is like, maybe from a source, mm -mm -mm. But once Meghan came on the scene, leaky ship, people were singing like a bird. Why? Because they were Meghan's spies. She was purposely putting that out there. She hired several PR firms to make sure the places like the Daily Mail, Page Six, our magazines were writing about her on a consistent basis. So when Meghan stands there and is like, I'm the victim, everybody's writing about me. It's like, well, girl, you're paying someone to make sure it happens. What are you talking about? James Holt, who was a former palace spokesperson and executive director of Archwell Foundation is then like, I regret telling them to play the media game because these same people who have said such horrible things about your family and and mother, now you have to perform for them. Cry me a river. These two bozos are at a public event for people. Of course, there's going to be media and press coverage. Someone who was a former palace spokesperson has no business being this dense. How whiny do these people have to be? Perform for them? Like, relax, it's just journalists and photographers covering an event. They then talk about how the press was talking to childhood friends of Meghan's and one of this childhood friends comes up and speaks in the documentary and says that her mom was quoted talking about Meghan being obsessed with Diana and how that's not true at all. Hmm, <laughs> I see Harry probably questioned Meghan about her childhood obsession with his late mother. And I wonder how much Meghan paid this friend of hers to take back her statement. Let me spill some inside tea to you guys about the media. Oftentimes what the media exposes is true, because if not, they can be sued. But the media still wants a story, right? So a lot of the time they come to this agreement with celebrities. Okay, we will expose this story that this celebrity does drugs, but you guys just deny it despite it being the truth and therefore no one goes to court. True story. This is usually the play-by-play -play celebrities have to resort to when they don't want to come clean about their drug addiction, but the media has already exposed it. I run a celebrity exposing blog and have done so for like nearly a decade, so I know how the media works. So simply saying, oh, that's not true, despite the original story going into detail about how Meghan would sit around and watch Charles and Diana's wedding and how she would play princess and blah, 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 isn't discrediting the story. It's just avoiding it. Later on in the episode, we get Doria back for two lines in this episode. I felt unsafe a lot. And I was stalked by paparazzi. I can name five times this lady was photographed, and even then I think that's a reach. A-list celebrities don't even complain about the paparazzi this much, but we got these Z-listers thinking they were really stalked. Megan then talks about her dad's side of the family, specifically her half-sister Samantha Markle. She brings on Samantha's daughter, Ashley, who doesn't speak to her mother. They talk about how Megan and Ashley reconciled, and I'm going to talk about that later on in the video, because Megan spews some more lies. They then show Harry saying that he explained family traditions to Meghan and that his family is the family she never had. They then recall Christmas at Sandringham where Meghan calls it incredible and she was even sat next to Harry's grandfather, Prince Philip, and she was talking to him and it was wonderful. They chatted and he was great. And this is actually funny since she kind of implied on Oprah that he was racist towards her and he actually got a lot of hate following the interview. So again, we see this backtracking of the race claims toward their family. They then show the wife of one of the Queen's cousins, Princess Michael of Kent, wearing a blackamoor brooch at the Christmas lunch, and how there is racist imagery in the palace and Professor Harry comes to speak to us about unconscious bias. So I guess he's trying to subtly call faraway relatives racist since it didn't work last time, that he tried to imply that his own family was racist? I don't know, what do you guys think? Harry also mentions his Nazi outfit and says that he's ashamed and it was his biggest mistake. 
They then jump to November 2021, where they're at an Air Force base in New Jersey, and Harry reflects on his 10 years in the army, saying that it's giving him a lived experience that his family wouldn't have had. Seemingly shading his brother, even though Prince William literally spent three months in Chile scrubbing toilets before he went to college. This holier-than-thou vendetta that he has against his brother just because William did the role expected from him is very annoying. But at the same time, they show us a clip of Harry when he was in the military saying that William sent him a letter saying that their mother would be so proud of him. Meghan then has the audacity to say that their life was going to be about them doing that job together, aka charity, since she's been doing it on her own for so long. Megan, sweetheart, you did charity like three times in your life. She literally rebranded as an activist in 2016 and went to Rwanda and India only, and was later exposed for having a photo shoot and exploiting the kids in Rwanda. She's not the philanthropic queen she thinks she is, and comparing her handful of charity stints to Harry's decade of service is just narcissism at its finest. A theme I realized in this series is that Meghan and Harry bring in people to say what they want them to say without Meghan and Harry saying it themselves. So essentially, they want a certain agenda out there, and they bring in, like, PR people to do it. Funny because they complain about the royal family doing the same thing. They then show us the first event that the formerly dubbed Fab Four was at, and how Meghan talked about Me Too, and then Tim Burke comes in and is like, royal family talks about things that are deliberately non-controversial, and that Meghan is more of an activist. Just because you keep saying she's an activist doesn't mean she actually is. They talk about tightening security for the wedding because Meghan got a letter sent to her that contained a white powder. Harry and Meghan spoke about how much security had to be at the wedding and like, no duh. It's a huge public event with millions in the street. The way they made it seem was that Meghan was the target of something. Meanwhile, that's just protocol for any event. Serena Williams is then brought on for like 12 seconds where she's like, they are so in love. And then we don't hear from her again. Then they talk about her dad and the staged photos that he did. Megan says that she got the news that the story was about to break the next day and she called her dad to see if he indeed did stage the photos, to which he denied, but she's like, I don't believe him. And then she says he's not picking up her calls, but he's talking to TMZ. And she found out that he's not coming to the wedding through TMZ. Then he has a heart attack and he's in the hospital not answering her. And she sends him a text saying to stop talking to the press. And then she goes on this conspiracy theory about how someone else is using his phone to text her back because he used her name in the text. And she's like, he would never call me by Megan. He always calls me Meg. And in the text messages, he says, sorry, my heart attack is an inconvenience and you guys can be sad after I die. Which Thomas says in real time that it was actually him texting that. His phone was not compromised, but his feelings were hurt by those messages that she sent to him. So he didn't really feel like talking to her. Also, they failed to acknowledge the fact that he tried to reach out to her afterward and she just completely refused. So just because he didn't answer you in the heat of the moment does not mean that he didn't reach out to you, but she fails to mention that. Harry then comes in to make matters worse and he's like, she had a father before all of this and now she doesn't and he's like, I shouldered that and he blames himself and he says that her dad would still be her dad if it wasn't for him. Like, wow, Megan really has him in this gaslighting with trance. Get well soon, Harry. I think that Thomas Markle was deeply hurt by how fast she disowned him, even before the staged photos. I mean, he was set to meet Harry just a week before the wedding. Who does that? Clearly Meghan was icing him out way before the staged photos. Maybe she was embarrassed by him or she was going up the social ladder so she didn't care for him. All I'm saying is that he has a reason to be hurt when she was icing him out before the staged photos. The fact that after the tensions of the wedding died down and she still refused to have any contact with them says a lot. And she of course did not mention that in the documentary. They then end the episode showing childhood footage of Meghan with her father and the media anticipating the wedding. So that concludes my episode 3 recap. Here are 6 lies they said in episode 3. Lie number 1. The engagement interview was rehearsed. Whiny Quirky Megan opened up episode 3 calling the engagement interview an orchestrated reality show and that it was rehearsed. She also said that they weren't allowed to tell their story, referencing the engagement interview. And before Harry cuts her off, she says, they didn't want, to which Harry says, we've never been asked our story. I found that funny because they didn't want you to tell it, but at the same time you weren't asked to tell it. And then when Megan called the interview rehearsed, Michelle Hussein, who interviewed them in 2017, said, we know recollections may vary on this particular subject, but my recollection is definitely very much asked to do an interview and do said interview. Woo! <laughs> Michelle referenced the Queen's iconic response to Harry and Meghan's lies on Oprah, saying recollections may vary, which in a nutshell is, you're a liar. Journalist Emily Andrew says, Interesting observation by Meghan that their engagement interview was an orchestrated reality show. 
I remember Kensington Palace saying that Meghan had specifically picked BBC's Michelle Hussain and was very specific on what she would and wouldn't say. As Michelle says, recollections may vary. There we go again with Meghan throwing working people under the bus. That is our personal decision to not feed into negativity, right? To really sort of be more cause-driven and action-based. Line number two, the house they filmed at. The house they show us in the documentary isn't actually theirs. It's a $33 million home that once belonged to disgraced CEO Mark Shalouf, who was previously charged with pocketing $116 million in a fundraising scam targeting disabled veterans. That's why the house is famous. It's reportedly a nine minute drive away from Meghan and Harry's house. Again, it's all smoke and mirrors, fake home, fake paparazzi shots, their list of lies keeps on getting longer and longer. If you guys recall, they had a falling out with the original director of the show, Garrett Bradley, who wanted them to film in their own home. But tell me more about how you want to be authentic and tell your story, but yet you film a documentary in a home that's not even yours, implying that it actually is. Line number three, Megan didn't wear bright colors because she wanted to blend in. Oh, thank you, Megan, for telling us more about how you were so oppressed in the few days that you worked as a senior royal. They show us Megan getting ready for the Salute to Freedom gala, and there's a bunch of people getting her dressed and ready. She's definitely trying to have a Princess Diaries moment, and pretty sure if this was her getting fitted for a royal event, we would have to sit through her moans and cries about how it's so much, and then there was four people under the dress. But because it's on her own terms, she's beaming and laughing and having a grand old time. She then starts talking about how poor widow charitable Megs rarely wore color in the UK and that there was thought in that. Does she want a cookie? There was thought in that? She's trying so hard to prove that she was this little innocent lamb. Meanwhile, she was stirring up so much trouble and harassing staff. She was like, you can't wear the same color as the queen or anyone else from the senior royals. And so that made her wear muted colors to blend in and not stand out. She wore beiges and whites and so on. First of all, that's not true. Here she is wearing bright purple at the One Young World Summit event. Here she is wearing a purple dress with a bright red coat and red pumps to match for her first royal engagement in 2019. In 2018, she wore this floral green dress for the Invictus Games Sydney celebration. Here is Emerald Green for the Well Child Awards. Olive Green at Prince Louis' christening and made herself stand out in the family photo. How about this red Valentino dress in 2019? Also, beige and white aren't muted colors. They are light colors that stand out. She was acting like she was wearing camo or black 24-7. Also, I'm pretty sure she wanted to wear those neutral tones because they gave her a sophisticated and elegant look. She expressed how much she loved her suit's wardrobe, and it seemed like she emulated that in her 72 days as a working royal. Line number four, Megan had no one to teach her anything. Megan says that she knew there was a protocol for how things were done. She then references the movie Princess Diaries. But what's funny here is how many times does she say that she didn't expect what she encountered? But now she knew there was protocol? I talked about this in my episode 2 recap where Meghan mocked the Queen and the curtsy because she referenced the Princess Diaries movies. And they show you in the Princess Diaries how to curtsy. And that movie was huge in America, so what was her excuse? In this episode, she references the movie and she says, There is no class and some person who goes, Sit like this, use this fork, choose this hat. It doesn't happen. Hmm, that's interesting because as I exposed in the Lies on Oprah video, Someone was hired specifically to teach Meghan what to do. Samantha Cohen, the Queen's private secretary who worked with the royals for 17 years and was someone who was well-loved and respected and regarded as the best of the best, was hired to work with Meghan. As a matter of fact, Samantha had already resigned the year before, but she agreed to stick around with the younger generation of royals. She also acted as interim private secretary to Harry and Meghan and put Meghan through six months of Duchess training. On top of that, Meghan was giving a 30-point dossier on how to be a duchess. It was given to her by Harry's then-private secretary, Ed Lane Fox, and it covered everything from fashion to ladies-in-waiting to arts in the UK and how to navigate public life. But it gets worse in this compulsive liar's path. Edmund Fried, a London-born etiquette expert, said that just before Meghan met the Queen, she recruited him for two-hour tea lessons that included everything from proper fork handling to the exact way to sip tea. He said that she enjoyed it so much that she wanted to come back again. In Finding Freedom, a book that Meghan is on record saying she gave information for, it was written that Meghan, the avid learner, was seen carrying binders full of research and that she got a royal masterclass in training from the Queen herself. While she's lying through her teeth, they show a tweet of someone making fun of her hat. And am I supposed to feel bad for her? That tweet probably had her unhinged for two weeks. But oh no, she wants to be a royal, but nobody can make a joke about her. So tell me again, Meghan, how there's no class and how it doesn't happen, you literal weirdo. 
Harry then claims that the press made up royal protocols and victim Megan says it was baptism by fire. Aww, you poor little victim. Like no, you purposely broke protocol and you provoked all of this. It wasn't made up protocol by any means. She's then asked about the royal wave and Quirky Megs is like, I guess you don't want to wave like an American and proceeds to do the stupidest wave ever. We Americans do not wave like hooligans. Please do not listen to her. She then says everything in the UK just smaller. And I think that's just because she's just used to her huge ego. She then says in a complaining tone that I needed to learn a lot and that she had to Google the national anthem. Anyone in a new position of work or anywhere in life needs to learn a lot. A Starbucks barista needs to learn a lot. I thought she was this brainy nerd that was not pretty, that loved to learn things. Okay, well, I'm not the pretty one. I was like, I was the smart one. I'm the smart one. I'm the right. smart one. Lie number five. Doesn't read the tabloids yet is updated on everything said about her. Throughout the episodes, Megan keeps mentioning word by word every story the media wrote about her. And for someone who claims she reads nothing being said about her, she truly knows everything. I don't read anything. Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> much safer that way. Um, but equally, I, that's just be my own personal preference. You know, one of my sources tells me she has a Google alert for her name. Megan even claims that every day she had to play whack-a-mole with the stories popping up about her. Talk about a control freak. Trying to censor the press as a public figure? Oh yeah, that's gonna be a hard one. She was also up to date on every story that was going to break the next day. That's how she knew the story about her father staging photos was about to break. So much for being an unbothered little Megs. Line number six, Palace denied her family invites. Earlier in the video, we talked about Megan and Ashley reconciling. After the engagement, Ashley says that communication with Megan became less frequent and that led her to assume that Megan's relationships were managed on some level. Oh really? Or is that the lie Megan told you? Because it's interesting how Megan is now recruiting her past when there were multiple, multiple credible sources who said that Megan dropped her old friends and families when she climbed up the social ladder. And the proof was that they weren't around when she started dating Harry. Then they have the audacity to claim that Megan's communications team advised her not to invite Ashley because Megan was like, how do we explain that the half-sister isn't invited but the half-sister's daughter is? Simple, you just invite her. But as suspected, that was a lie. A well-placed source speaks up and says, it was completely in Megan's gift as to which members of her friends and family to invite to her wedding. It wasn't a discussion, it was her decision. One source noted the irony that Ashley, who Megan had sought to shield from media intrusion, now appears on camera as part of a global Netflix program. And implying that the guest list was messed with just because Megan only wanted A-listers that she never met invited to her wedding before her family is low, even for her. Palace insiders deny that they tried to stop Megan from communicating with Ashley. Here's what I think happened. I think that Megan dropped Ashley and it was only when she needed people in her corner, especially those from her life pre-Harry, that's when she picked them up back again. Because no way your team was like, no, don't invite your niece, and Megan being the queen of following all the roles and being quiet, obliged. No, Megan did whatever she felt like doing and that continues to be proven every day. She only reached out to Ashley in 2021, conveniently when she was filming for Netflix. What stopped her from reaching out to her in 2020? We had nothing to do but sit around in a pandemic. Anyway, this wraps up their lies and recap video. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please let me know if you do because I only make them for you guys. Check out my Megan and Harry playlist to be up to date with everything that's going on with these two. Like and subscribe for more content, follow us on social media, and as always, I'll see you next time.